first off, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for coming down tonight. Um, as you may be aware, uh, the law school have attempted to cancel this attempt, this event, three times now. So we are very happy to finally be hosting it. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Ben. I'm the president of the Free Speech Society here at Bristol, um, and I'll be chairing the interview today. But with that out of the way, it, it's my very great, great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Stephen Greer. Speaker today, uh, Professor Stephen Greer. Um, so, in ways of introduction to both Stephen and the uh, situation uh, this talk will be about, um, Professor Greer is a Professor of Human Rights at University of Bristol's Law School. Um, he studied Law and Sociology at Oxford and LSE, going on to attain a PhD in Law from Queen's University in Belfast. In a career spanning nearly 40 years, Professor Greer has taught and uh, written papers throughout the UK and abroad, including in China and at Harvard. He is a Fellow of the Academy of Sci Social Sciences and Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Professor Greer has acted as consultant and advisor to various organisations, most recently as visiting research fellow at the Oxford Institute for British Islam, which he joined earlier this year. His areas of expertise include criminal justice, human rights, terrorism, and his most recent study, Tackling Terrorism in Britain, Threats, Responses and Challenges 20 Years After 9-11, was published last October. In October of 2020, the Bristol of the University of Bristol Islamic Society lodged a formal complaint against Professor Greer, alleging systemic Islamophobia in his teaching of the module Islam, China and the Far East in the Human Rights in Law, Politics and Society Unit and his public defence of the Prevent Strategy. In February 2021, Bristol launched a public campaign against Professor Greer, demanding the scrapping of the module and an apology to all Muslim students. The petition against him has since garnered nearly 4,000 signatures. The allegations against him included his comments on the Charlie Hebdo attacks, Islamic attitudes towards women and the repressive nature of Islam. The campaign has since been covered by news outlets such as Al Jazeera, Five Pillars and Islam 21C and also the Daily Mail. In February, Professor Greer reported a suspicious incident outside his home which caused him and his wife to flee the city. In July of 2021, following a five-month inquiry, Professor Greer was exonerated of all accusations of Islamophobia by a University of Bristol inquiry, a verdict unanimously upheld on appeal in October. At the start of the 2021-22 term, the law school removed the Islam, China and the Far East module from the Human Rights in Law, Politics and Society syllabus in order to, amongst other things, avoid a recurrence of complaints and to ensure that, quote, Muslim students in particular do not feel that their religion is being singled out or in any way othered by the class material. The university official statement in October announced that the complaint was not upheld, but the concerns reported by Bristol were recognised in addition, they stated the module had to be, not been cancelled, but that to be respectful of sensitivities of students on the course, there had been changes in emphasis. Bristol's campaign continues with the university making no requirement for them to desist or any suggestion that their actions amounted to misconduct. In September of last year, student Professor Greer's perspectives were published for the first time in the Mail on Sunday in an article entitled University Clears Don of Being Anti-Islam but then cancels his course anyway after students launched a quote vicious and militant campaign. It's worth saying that Bristol were invited to be part of the event today however respectfully declined to attend based on claims that nobody knowledgeable enough about the controversy would be able to speak. The conversation with Professor Greer will consist of discussions around the cancellation of the event, Bristol's accusations, uh, the complaints process and the impacts of the process. At the end of this session, there will be uh, time for questions and answers with Professor Greer. So, uh, to kick off the event, thank you, Professor Greer, for coming along. You're very right. welcome. Thank you. As some people may be aware, this event was initially uh, meant to take place in December of last year, but was cancelled, uh, well, now almost three times by the law school, uh, who tried to stop it from happening again uh, this evening. Can you explain why? Yes, of course. Uh, but first, let me begin by offering my profound gratitude to the Bristol Free Speech Society for the invitation to contribute to the event this evening. Throughout the entire ordeal which I've suffered and which has been going on for over a year now, this is the first opportunity I've had fully to tell my side of the story. As a result of the damage to my mental health caused by Bristol's social media campaign against me, and the adequate support from the law school and the university. Dr. Myers signed me off work from September to January this year. The law school and the university have now tried a total of six times to vent me about my experience, including the ones to which you've referred. 
We'll come to how Bristock's complaint has been mishandled later. But to cut a very long story short, I've had medical clearance to return to work for months. However, the law school continues to insist that I need its permission before this can happen, and they have persistently refused to give it. So in other words, the return to work process has turned out to be the opposite. Repeat, repeated attempts to frustrate a return to work. So does that mean that you're fully back at work now? Well, as far as I'm concerned, yes, it does. But this is in spite of the fact that the toxic environment in the law school remains unaddressed. Um, so when you say a toxic environment, what do you mean by that? Well, I know that several members of the academic staff, including some in my own corridor, are hostile to my case. And apart from a dozen or so, I've received no support whatever from the rest of my colleagues. And this support I have received has been private and not public. Two organisations the law school supports, University of Bristol uh, uh, Unity and Diversity in Law and the University of Bristol Women in Law Society signed Brissock's petition to have me sacked. In spite of repeated requests on my part, the law school has refused to do anything about any of this. So, in your opinion, how should the university and the law school have been uh, working to facilitate your return to work and solve this toxic work environment? Well, one of the first things that needs to happen is that the university should discipline Russell for its misconduct and mark publicly to withdraw its accusations and apologise for the harm, the, the, the considerable harm it's caused. And the University of Bristol Unity and Diversity in Law Group and the University of Bristol Women in Law Society should be required to do likewise. OK, thank you. Um, kind of moving on to uh, Bristol's um, position and their uh, um, accusations against you. Obviously, they are not here tonight. Um, do you have any comments that you'd make about Bristol's absence? And if they had been here, um, what would you have said to uh, representatives of their society? Well, I'm very disappointed, uh, but not surprised that they're not here because they've refused to engage with me uh, about this issue from the very beginning. Had they been here, I would have asked them three principal questions. First, why have you subjected me, a, a totally innocent party, to a potentially life-threatening campaign based on nothing but a toxic mixture of lies, distortion and misrepresentation? stemming from rumour and hearsay from anonymous third parties, propelled by a malicious intention to harm and a shock of acquaintance with the relevant authoritative literature and informed debates. Second, what is your defence to the accusation that you may have committed a number of possible legal wrongs? These include defamation, harassment, hatred and, and intimidation, conspiracy to induce the breach of my employment contract, and conspiracy to induce breach of the university's legal duty of care to me as my employer. Third, when are you going to stop your campaign against me, retract all allegations, and publicly apologise for the harm you've caused? So thank you for that. So you mentioned that you think their actions uh, constitute misconduct. Um, are you considering taking any disciplinary action against them, either through the university or legal system? Yes. A team of lawyers is working on my case and has been for quite a few months, but obviously I can't say anything more about the details at this stage. Thank you. So to put, I guess, what the principal question is here quite, uh, quite bluntly, um, you've been accused of being an Islamophobe, are you? Well, no, of course not. This is a totally risible accusation. I don't hate Muslims or Islam. On the contrary, I fully recognise that Islam is a faith with world historical significance and that it has produced people and civilizations with many noble and admirable features. Muslims in the UK and elsewhere have contributed massively to global human experience and are also fully entitled to be protected from anti-Muslim prejudice and discrimination. There are also many debates to be had about the profile of Muslims and their faith in the contemporary world, including in the West. Repeatedly made all of this clear in class and elsewhere. So can and should really a distinction be made between Islamophobia and discussions of Islam, especially when it comes to discussions from people who are not part of the Muslim community? Uh, yes, of course. Um, let me tell you how I think the distinction should be made. Uh, Islamophobia is the visceral and intolerant hatred of Islam and Muslims based on caricature, misleading stereotypes, falsehoods and misrepresentations. 
clearly it can and does cause a great deal of personal social damage. Like all social prejudices, it must be rooted out wherever encountered, including by universities. However, the social, economic, political, legal and moral implications of any faith or ideology must be open to debate by everyone, especially in universities. Islam is no exception. Brissop does not seem to understand either this distinction or that I've always stayed on the correct side of it. They appear to assume that anything anyone says about Islam, which they dislike, is Islamophobic. You said that there should be a distinction between these two things, but is there not a grey area there that's very difficult to tease out? Uh, there is, of course. However, the key issue is whether critical reflections on Islam and on any ideology for that matter are expressed in a measured and reasoned manner and are supported by sound evidence confirmed by the authoritative academic literature. Particular Number three positions can be distinguished in the literature about human rights and Islam. I've also made this abundantly clear in class and elsewhere. One of these is the claim that the human rights ideal is un-Islamic. Muslims mm. should have nothing to do with it. According to this view, they should instead adhere to what God prohibits, dictates, permits, religious in the Quran and other sacred sources. Another is the view that Muslims discovered human rights long before the West and that the Islamic conception is by far superior because it is divinely ordained. A third view is that Islamic and non-Islamic approaches to human rights are not fundamentally irreconcilable. Okay. So do you consider there to be a position in the literature um, in which Islam and human rights, I mean, uh, human rights as is understood in the context of Western democracies, are compatible or even complementary? Yes, the literature is full of that, this, but it will, of course, take a lot of give and take on both sides. And the more either side is inflexible, the less likely this is to occur. So when it comes to this distinction between Islamophobia and legitimate critique of Islam, who should, who should be making this distinction? Shouldn't it be made in collaboration with Muslim students? And specifically, if we're talking about a University of Bristol definition, the students attending this university? Well, in my view, in universities, drawing distinctions of this kind is really right. the responsibility of the academic staff. Concerned. After all, this is one of the things we're paid for. We're the ones who are supposed to have the experience and expertise. But this certainly doesn't mean we have a monopoly of insight or wisdom. Teachers must also be allowed to play devil's advocate in class by presenting issues and ideas which they themselves don't subscribe and to which perhaps few would subscribe. It's a very big mistake to think that university education is about learning the correct view on every issue. Its primary purpose, even in highly technical subjects such as law and medicine, is to get students to think for themselves and to make informed choices between right outlooks and perspectives. Students are, of course, entitled to contribute to debates about the content of syllabuses and the curriculum, and there are many opportunities to do so at the university. University of Bristol. They can, for example, bring preferences and concern the attention of their tutors. They can also raise them in seminars. They can draw attention to them in, in the annual course evaluations. Student reps can also raise such issues at school meetings. And there are also various staff student consultation processes. However, apart from a misunderstanding to which I'll come later, not a single query, complaint, or any issue about Islamophobia in my teaching or other public output has ever been raised through any of these routes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so let's move on to the specifics of your teaching. For those of you who are not part of the class, can you outline briefly what the intention and the context of the uh, Human Rights in Law, Politics and Society unit was? Well, since the mid-1980s, I've taught various human rights courses in many, many different places. But until about 15 years ago, those in the University of Bristol Law School were, perhaps not surprisingly, very law-oriented. Then around 2005, I had the opportunity to design and teach a unit which sought to integrate my interest in human rights with my backgrounds in law and social science. What emerged was an optional course I named Human Rights in Law, Politics and Society. It originally had nine modules or topics, each involving a 50-minute lecture supported by a two-hour seminar. The unit could be described, could have been described, as socio-legal or as a social science unit. 
But my preference was to call it a critical engagement with global current affairs through a human rights lens or vice versa. Now, needless to say, it had to be approved by the law school and the university before it found its way onto the curriculum. And as with every other unit on the law curriculum, the content is described every year in annual advertising. It has also been audited every year since, including by a series of external examiners who have unanimously praised it and have never found anything wrong with it. The law school also conducted a thorough review of the entire undergraduate law curriculum in 2019-20. Human rights and law, politics and society is one of the few units which remained on the curriculum without discussion or query. Had there been any suspicion of Islamophobia, would this have been the ideal opportunity for the future of the unit to have been considered. Every year, without exception, the unit has also attracted the more reflective and thought students, including a significant proportion of Muslims. Student performance in assessments is also one of the highest in the law school, with about a third obtaining first class marks, including several outstanding results. As part of this uh, this unit, why has there been a topic on Islam, China, and the Far East? Well, when designing the unit, one thing was crystal clear. The post-Second World War, Cold War, they say we're in another Cold War, but certainly the post-Second World War one was over, and debates about law, politics, economics, and society could no longer credibly be conducted within the standard framework, which assumed the dominance of competing Western and Soviet models. Africa was already covered elsewhere in the law curriculum, so this left the Islamic world, China, and the Far East as the principal non-Western perspectives on relevant debates. In the aftermath of the Cold War, the global political significance of Islam has also greatly increased. This has been reflected in, amongst other things, a mushrooming of literature on human rights and Islam. So, as part of this um, topic, you've been accused of othering Muslims. Why was there no comparable topic on other world religions? Well, there was. This, this accusation simply isn't true. In previous years, Buddhism and Hinduism were also included. But this was abandoned mainly because this, it spread the net too widely and the relevant literature, by, by sharp contrast with that on Islam and human rights, is very sparse. Christianity didn't escape critical scrutiny either. After all, medieval Catholicism provided the ideological justification for feudalism, and it was opposition to feudalism which primed the liberal revolutions from which the modern human rights ideal arose. But the principal reason for focusing upon Islam, China, and the Far East is because of their global profile as non-Western ideologies with significant implications for human rights, increasingly debated, as I've just said, in an expanding literature. So, to move on to some of the complaints, you've been very clear that you consider the Bristol's campaign to be based on what you say are misrepresentation and lies. Um, what examples would you give to back up this claim? Well, let's start with the lies. One of the most egregious of these at the centre of Bristol's vicious uh, social media campaign mm -hmm. concerned the Uyghurs. Now, the Uyghurs, as many people will know already, are a Muslim minority in Western China repressed by the Chinese party state, including by mass imprisonment without trial, coupled with systematic forced so-called re-education. Brissock alleged that I claim that these horrendous human rights abuses are merely superficially discriminatory. But it is difficult to regard this as anything other than a deliberate lie, because it involves combining a statement I made about counterterrorism in Britain in one part of the unit with the exact opposite of what I said about Brissock in another. Well into Bristock's social media campaign, the accusation was quietly and unobtrusively withdrawn without apology. Yet it long remained a highly visible item on their social media platforms, including the petition demanding my dismissal and the scrapping of the module, which mm -hmm. can attract signatures right up to a few weeks ago. Bristock has also alleged that the university ignored repeated complaints about the phobia in my teaching of the output in the past, Yet, in fact, the only relevant previous complaint stemmed from confusion by some complainants regarding an amusing quote in class which is Confucius, an ancient Chinese text which they thought came from the Quran. Not only did I make the source clear, I was visibly holding a copy of the Analects in my hand as I read from it. 
Rissok also claimed that I deny there is no such thing as Islamophobia. Yet in 2019, I published a law school blog entitled Know Your Enemy, Racism and Islamophobia. Yeah, can you just outline the arguments that you made in this blog uh, for those who may not have read it? Well, the central argument is that both racism and Islamophobia are abhorrent social prejudices. But there are complex connections and disconnections between the two. Islam is a, ra a religion and not a race. Here it's come from many races. Therefore, Islamophobia cannot be a form of racism. Understanding the differences and similarities between various social prejudices, including racism and Islamophobia, is an essential prerequisite to tackling them effectively. So are there any other, what you would consider, lies in Rissop's campaign that you would like to uh, draw attention to? Yes, there were loads. Uh, the most menacing were those contained in a TikTok video uploaded to Brissock's Instagram account in August last year, after my official exoneration in July. This claims that I brought the Quran into a class when it was not relevant, mocked and laughed at it, and said it was utter nonsense. This seems to indicate that, that the misunderstanding behind what I call the Confucian confusion is still being circulated as true. However, the TikTok video doesn't only retail outrageous lies. These lies are, of course, the kind which, if believed, could seriously jeopardize my, my life. I don't mean by anyone in Brissock, but they could easily trigger an attack by somebody else. People have been murdered for less, after all. Take, for example, the French school teacher Samuel Petit, murdered for showing the controversial cartoons of Prophet Muhammad in class. I was compared with him in the social media storm generated by Brissock's life-threatening campaign. Closer to home, widely respected Conservative MP David Amos was murdered by a jihadi terrorist only a few months ago in spite of having very little connection with or interest in Muslims or Islam. I think it's worth saying here that neither of these assailants have any connection to the Islamic community here at Bristol and their actions would in fact be considered un-Islamic. Um, by the majority of British Muslims. Why should Brissock have been considering the actions of these potential third parties when they were making public statements about your case? Well, we must all, of course, be aware that words have consequences and that others may act upon what we say in ways we may not have intended. In fact, neither the murderers uh, of Samuel Patty nor David Amos had anything to do with the local Muslim community's concern. Although in the Patty case, the social media campaign began in the locality, the murderer travelled from another part of France, 100 kilometres away, with the sole objective of killing him. So with Islamophobia still a major issue for many Muslims, both on campus and in the UK more widely, do we not have to be equally as wary about the um, potential actions of third parties when we make uh, incendiary remarks about Islam? Yes, of course, and I've never made any intentional remarks about Islam. I repeatedly said that I do not deny that Islamophobia is an issue, both on campus and elsewhere. But it's also clear that every free society and every self-respecting university in a free society must protect responsible critical engagement of all ideologies, including Islam. We should therefore be equally concerned about both. So I'd like to explore a couple of the allegations in a little bit more depth for a moment. Um, first, could you give us some examples of the misrepresentations and distortions that you claim Brissock's campaign suffered? Brissock, for, well, for example, Brissock claims that it is, Islamic phobic, it is Islamophobic to observe, as I have, that Islam spread rapidly after the death of the Prophet, as was war and conquest driven by imperialistic aspirations. This is not Islamophobic. It is simply an historical fact, universally acknowledged by Muslim and non-Muslim scholars alike. It is also one of the many examples Brissock. of Brissock's shocking lack of acquaintance with the relevant literature. Brissock also claims that anyone who denies the British Prevent Counter-Terrorist Programme is racist and Islamophobic, as I do, must themselves be racist and Islamophobic. This is simply absurd. It's also completely at variance with the reliable evidence fully documented in my latest book, to which you referred in the introduction, Tackling Terrorism in Britain. 
So Bristol also strongly objected to a reference uh, in the module to uh, the Charlie Hebdo attacks in 2015, uh, which you use as an example of insult to Islam being punishable by death. Do you still stand by that as an appropriate example? Well, the Charlie Hebdo massacre is indisputably an example of killing in the name of Islam as punishment for alleged blasphemy, even though most Muslims would deplore it. Citing it as an example in the lecture was intended to open up this kind of debate in the seminars. A better example, which I've also used in the past, is the death sentence issued against British Muslim novelist Salman Rushdie in 1989 by the founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini. But students in the 2020s are much less familiar with this than those in the early 1990s. Other contemporary examples would be the penal codes of certain Muslim countries such as or Pakistan, which is right. capital punishment for blasphemy. In kind of other areas, the language that you used both in, in lectures and public statements and even earlier in this interview um, could be seen as hostile to Muslims. So your, your um, assertions that the campaign is based on, to quote you, uh, nothing but a toxic mixture of lies, distortion and, and misrepresentations, um, and that it was propelled by a malicious intent to harm, along with your consistent repetition, the campaign itself was life-threatening. Do you think, as a lecturer, this is an appropriate way to address Muslim students? I've never used language hostile to Muslims in lectures or elsewhere. Quotes to which you refer are about Bristol's campaign, not about Muslim students or Muslim students in general. And in fact, I've had a lot of support for what I've said about it from other Muslims. And I've already given a more than adequate explanation of why Brissock's campaign was and remains life-threatening. Over the years, I've had many different colleagues attend my lectures and seminars as part of the law school's routine exercise in quality assurance. The one on Islam, China and the, and the Far East pro proved a favourite with assessors who never once raised any quiet query about the language, content, or delivery. Indeed, I was always commended on how well-structured, comprehensive, and thoughtful they were. If I'm honest, I think a more accurate criticism would be that they're a bit dull and pedestrian. I think the next thing to tackle is your defense of the prevent strategy, which was raised by Brissop, and specifically the fact that you refute it is Islamophobic in nature. Um, could you outline briefly what your view on the prevent strategy is and what it does and your, your position on it? Well, the Prevent Counterterrorism Programme is one of the so-called four Ps in the official strategy known as CONTEST. This has been developed by success. CONTEST has been developed by successive UK yeah. coalition and conservative governments since 9-11. The other three are Prepare, Protect and Pursue. Uh, each is considered fully in my book, Tactic Terrorism in Britain. Prevent has several official purposes. It is intended to stop people from becoming terrorists or from supporting terrorism of any kind by countering terrorist ideology and challenging those who promote it. This is known as counter radicalization. It also aims to support cooperative individuals who are particularly vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism. This is known as de radicalization. It also seeks to promote cooperation with sectors and institutions in society where the risk of radicalization. Radicalization in this sense is considered high. For several reasons, it is difficult to regard prevent as Islamophobic and or racist. First, it is based on models developed by non-white Muslim countries, most of which now have their own equivalents. Second, it doesn't only address issues relating to radical Islam and Islamism. In fact, over half the referrals now involve what's known as mixed, unclear or unstable ideologies, the other half being split more or less equally between Islamist or right concerns. Third, jihadi terrorism, Islamist terrorism, has been responsible for over 90% of the fatalities and just short of 100% of the thousand or so total casualties in domestic terrorism over the past 20 years. It should be no surprise, therefore, that concerns about Islamist radicalization feature prominently in prevent referrals. Thank you. So uh, there have also been accusations published on Bristol's Instagram uh, on the 13th of March that when you were challenged on some of your beliefs, 
students have felt put down or that you'd come across as biased and arrogant. Um, how should lecturers respond to students who disagree with the content being taught? Uh, my, my response to the first part of your question is as follows. Chris Hop has told so many demonstrable lies that nothing they or their supporters say can be believed unless it is corroborated by reliable evidence. Without exception, all these accusations were thoroughly um, explored in the official investigation and have been were allegedly made by an anonymous students. In the absence of any reliable corroboration, there are therefore no grounds for believing them. And we should be even more suspicious of them for two other reasons. As I've said, apart from the Confucius confusion, nobody ever raised any such concerns through the law schools of official and unofficial channels of complaint ever before. Furthermore, the university's assessor who conducted the investigation also received a number of testimonials from students attesting to quite the opposite. And unlike Brissock's anonymous complainants, these sources identified themselves by name. Turning to the other part of your question, where students disagree with the content of what they're being taught, as I've intimated already, they should engage in discussion about it with their teachers, not launch a social media campaign to ruin their reputations and their careers, deprive them of their livelihoods, ostracize them from their colleagues, potentially expose them to the risk of physical attack. Thank you. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we'll um, stop there on the kind of discussions of the campaign before we move on to the complaints. Um, but we, I would just like to take a little bit of a break, um, specifically if there, I don't know if there are any members of Bristol in the audience who would like to maybe respond to some of the things that um, uh, Professor Greer has stated. Um, if that's the case, then put your hand up and we'll come to you and allow you to have the floor. Um, otherwise, I might ask a couple of questions um, that have come up on the slide though that directly relate to um, what you've been talking about. Um, so the first one that I think has come up quite a lot is that um, there's been quite a few re relations, for example, to um, capitalism and other religions like Christianity and Judaism that could be considered harmful or to not promote human rights. Um, is this something that you discuss or is this something that you would uh, discuss? Well, capitalism certainly features in, in the, um, in the uh, syllabus. Um, maybe not as directly as some people would like. Judaism doesn't. Um, uh, as I said before, you can't have every religion and every, every ism on the agenda. Marxism features, but again, not particularly prominently. The point, the point about this is, of course, all, all units taught in the University of Bristol have prescribed um, limits in terms of length and substance and whatever. So you've got to squeeze in, to a, in a, to a 20 point unit, you've got to squeeze in a huge amount of potential literature and some stuff will inevitably, inevitably be left out. But as I've said to you before, the reason why Islam, China and the Far East was chosen as a topic is because these have been highly visible um, um, alternatives to the Western human rights ideal with significant implications for human rights. Um, ideologically, and not, not, I mean, the issue, the issue here isn't what their implications for human rights compliance is necessarily. The issue, one of the, the primary issue is the ideological implications. And the profile of these outlooks has greatly increased over the past 10, 20, 20 years. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the last thing that I just wanted to address was a comment on here that um, asked, you know, were there not any academics um, outside of Bristol who would be uh, critical of your view um, or who would be willing to discuss this um, publicly? Um, I'm sure there are, but we wanted this event to be focused on the, uh, the campaign and the complaint, which obviously you need someone involved with, which uh, I guess is a perfect segue into the next part of our talk, which will be specifically about the formal complaint. Stephen, most of us don't, won't really know what the formal complaints process looks like, either as someone bringing the complaint or on the receiving end of it. Can you tell us a little bit what this looks like? Yep. At the University of Bristol, formal complaints against staff may be submitted by any student on the form provided. Amongst other things, this must be, except in very exceptional circumstances, within 90 days of the alleged misconduct. Anonymous complaints are admissible only in exceptional circumstances. 
circumstances and for, for very good specific reasons. The university also has responsibility to protect its staff against unacceptable behaviour as the complaint is being processed. In most circumstances, the university will seek to initiate mediation between the parties. There were, however, multiple flaws in the formal process in my case. These include the refusal of Brissock to agree to mediation from the very beginning, the, the failure of the university officially to notify me of the fact and the details of the complaint until mid 2021, three and a half months after it had been lodged. The fact the, that the official complaint was lodged well after 90 days, well over 90 days after the Islam, China and the Far East lecture had been delivered in 2019 20. and before it had been delivered in the academic year 2020-2021. The university has also failed to protect me from Brissock's hostile social media campaign since it began in February last year. Thank you. So do you think it would have been beneficial for a conversation to take place between yourself and the affected students at some point during this process? I certainly wish such a conversation had taken place. I was very amenable to it even after Brissock launched their campaign. Sadly, they weren't. And, you know, the, the Human Rights and Law, Politics and Society module has been running for, as you say, 15 years now. Um, have you had any complaints about it in the past? And why, in your view, was this public campaign undertaken now rather than closer to when the complaint, the alleged complaints were initially raised? Well, I'm afraid the answer to the latter part of your question suggests that the good faith of the complaint is very much in doubt. As I've said, apart from the Confucian confusion, up to October 2020, there had been no complaint about anything remotely Islamophobic in the entire 14 years the unit and the topic had been on the curriculum. The campaign is clearly an example of a much wider and disturbing phenomenon. I refer to tiny mobs of militant students and others bent on bringing down their teachers simply because they disagree with their lawful contributions to legitimate academic and other debates. But I'm not alone in thinking that two more specific factors may have prompted the, the, the Brissocks complaint and campaign. The first of these is that over the past few years, some colleagues in Bristol and elsewhere have been trying to discredit my defense of prevent by playing the man, not the ball. The second factor is the suspicion that Brissock's campaign was intended to put the university under pressure, not to dismiss sociology professor Deer, a prominent anti-Zionist then under investigation for anti-Semitism and since sacked by the university. And so, um, just briefly, in case people haven't heard of it, uh, David Miller was sacked, uh, I think, last year for accusations of Islamophobia. Um, following no, uh, Anti-Semitism. Uh, Anti-Semitism, sorry, my mistake, I've just got it on the brain, apparently. Um, <laughs> but yes, um, following uh, comments made in uh, lectures and uh, later in some podcast appearances uh, with outside organisations. But why do you think the university chose to fire David Miller and not you? Um, is this evidence that the university takes anti-Semitism more seriously than Islamophobia within the university? Well, the, the key issue with the David Miller case is that nobody but the university and possibly David Miller himself knows precisely why he was sacked. We do know, because the university has told us, that a QC decided neither he nor I have been guilty of unlawful conduct. But the university has nevertheless decided that Miller's behaviour otherwise fell below minimum professional standards. And as I have repeatedly said, I was officially and unreservedly exonerated from all Brissock's accusations. On the basis of the information in the public domain, therefore, there are no grounds whatsoever for believing that the university tolerates Islamophobia, but not anti-Semitism. And so how well do you think the university has handled would you change and what would you do to change the process in the future? Several things should have happened which didn't. First, the university should have involved me in responding to Brissock's formal complaint when it was first lodged in October 2020. As it happened, I didn't find out any details, as I already said, until Brissock launched their vicious social media campaign three and a half months later. Second, the university should have taken immediate disciplinary 
action against the Walden campaign because it's gross, it constitutes gross misconduct as soon as it was launched. Quite properly, the university routinely disciplines students found guilty of cheating and assessments. By sharp contrast, in my case, it is no effective steps, whatever, to discipline those who have sought to ruin my reputation and my career, deprive me of my livelihood, and potentially expose me to physical harm, merely for having made lawful contributions to legitimate and vital academic debates. Third, the university should discipline me. So the university's response to the controversy took issue with what it saw as a disappointing breach of confidentiality, firstly by Bristock's campaign, then by the article uh, you uh, supported in the Mail on Sunday. How do you respond to this assertion? Well, there are some uh, doubts about whether either of us was, in fact, under, under any genuinely legally binding duty of confidentiality. But assuming that we were, from February to the present, Rissock's social media campaign has been in continuous breach of it. Throughout the inquiry, I scrupulously observed any duty of confidentiality I, I may have had. However, even if there was one, for two main reasons, I no longer regard myself bound by it. First, matters already in the public domain are not covered by confidentiality. Rissock has already publicly disclosed everything of substance relevant to the inquiry, to which I've publicly referred, or intend to refer to here or elsewhere. Excuse me. Second, duties of confidentiality are not absolute. One clear exception is the need to avoid serious harm. I've used every opportunity, including that provided by the Mail on Sunday, not only to set the record straight about my case, but also to reduce the risk of physical attack. Thank you, Professor Greer. And so I think now what we'll move on to is potentially one of the most important issues uh, surrounding this, which is the impact of the complaint on the campaign on you personally. So um, in your view, what has the attitude towards the controversy been by students and faculty at the university? Has it been more positive towards you or Bristock side of the debate? I think a lot of staff and students are afraid to make any public or indeed any comment at all in my support in case they denounce this Islam phobic. This is certain this is almost certainly the reason I've had no public support from any of the staff at the University of Bristol, including the law school, from the academic profession in the UK or elsewhere, from human rights NGOs or human rights course, or from any of the handful of professional organizations using the lecturers union the UCU to which I belong. I've also, however, had very welcome private support, as I said, from a dozen or so of my law school colleagues and a number of students, but none from anybody else in the rest of the University of Bristol. And as I've already said, a number of current and former students contact disputing Brissock's complaint. However, I've also had very welcome unsolicited public support from the Free Speech Union, the Mail on Sunday, other campaigning organizations, internet bloggers, and two Bristol students, one of whom is a Muslim, who systematically demolished Bristol's hostile campaign in a video uploaded to the student perspective in February last year, which I would refer anybody who doubts anything that I've said. This has, of course, been extremely welcome, and I'm enormously grateful to all concerned for it. And how has Bristol's campaign impacted you and your family, both professionally and emotionally? Well, the emotional and psychological damage has been substantial. I've already referred to having been compared to Samuel Paddy, to the suspicious incident outside my home, to the TikTok video, and to the murder of David Amos, all of which have caused me and my family considerable distress and concern. I was on sick leave from September last year to January this year for these reasons, including the sheer strain of having to defend myself in the investigation and try and hear my name publicly. However, in spite of the venom and hostility of Brissock's social media campaign, I've not silenced by it, but others almost certainly will have been. A major element in giving me a voice has been the event here this evening, for which, as I already indicated, I'm enormously grateful. I'm also very grateful to the host of the official launch of my book, Tackling Terrorism in Britain, 
which uses is many of the themes to which Brissop object, for referring to my exoneration in his introductory remarks. And my recent appointment as the first visiting research fellow at the newly established think tank, the Oxford Institute for British Islam, has been an absolute godsend. And when you talk about your anxiety, do you think this has been caused solely due to the hostile nature of the campaign or more generally about being discussed so publicly without any prior warning? Well, the primary problem by a long way stems from Brissock's potentially life-threatening campaign and the lack of anything approaching adequate support from the university oh. school and my colleagues. The fact that the university has still made no attempt to require Brissock to stop their campaign against me and publicly to withdraw the accusations and apologise has compounded these problems. As a result, my return to the Wills building during normal working hours will be very challenging. There's obviously, you know, your side of the story, but also there's, there's Bristocks as well, and they've referred to the emotional damage that has been caused by the process and arguably some of your comments, um, and they uh, referred to kind of low self-esteem and even suicidal thoughts, which was reported in the Bristol tab. Um, do you have any sympathy for these students, given what you've been through, and how should the university respond to what these students have said? Well, Bristock, as you said, have had every opportunity to come here and tell us all about how this has impacted them, and they declined to do so. But I, I assume by the process you mean how the university handled the complaint. But let us not forget that both the formal complaint and the defamatory social media campaign were launched by Brissock and not by me. Nor should we forget that I was obliged to sit back and take everything Brissock threw at me without responding until the Mail on Sunday covered my story in September last year. And we should not forget either that I have been unreservedly exonerated from all Brissock's charges including the unfounded allegations about the alleged emotional impact upon students of what I'm supposed to have said. If those concerned were prepared, or indeed if they, if they are now prepared to come forward, I'd still be very willing, in spite of whatever, everything that's happened, to talk to them about it. Thank you. Um, and, you know, you talk about this, but many students have reported feeling unable to come forward about issues they are having at university, whether that be for, for mental health, um, up to things like experiencing sexism and racism. Do you think disciplining students would prevent those with legitimate claims of Islamophobia from coming forward? As I've already said, apart from the Confucius confusion, not a single complaint prior to that brought by Bristol has been yeah. made about alleged Islamophobia or any of my teaching through the law schools many channels. I've been in this institution for, for over 35 years. There is also a huge difference between lodging complaints and launching potentially life-threatening social campaigns. The former should, of course, be permitted. The latter prohibited in all circumstances. And finally, there's one more thing that I would kind of like to ask you about the um, scenario surrounding the cancellations of the events that have, um, uh, you know, led to, to today. Obviously, um, you know, you've talked about your anxiety and how um, important events like this have been for your, um, for your health. Um, how do you, how would you say that the, you know, the cancellations and the actions of the law school have impacted on your mental health and your anxieties? Well, it certainly hasn't helped. I mean, what I wanted from the law school, what I wanted from the university, I've, I've spelt out already, and none of that's been done. I wanted their support. I wanted them to, to facilitate my return to work, not to obstruct it. Um, I wanted them to celebrate my exoneration, not to compound it by acknowledging Brissock's concerns and the need to um, uh, alter the unit in order to respect the, the, the sensitivities of students taking it. So all of this, it has not been, it's not been good. I mean, it's, it's been, well, the, the, the main, the main uh, emotional reaction that I have to it is just deep, deep anger because none of this should happen, have happened. None of this should be happening. And, um, uh, and, Nobody, nobody with the power and authority to do anything to stop it from happening is is taking the requisite action. Thank you. And you know, you've been the one last thing I would like to ask you is that 
um, you know, you've been very, I think, brave in talking about these issues, um, especially given the context. Do you think that um, the situation has, the, the law school have used the situation, you know, your, you know, the, the things that kept you off work and effectively weaponized them against you to stop you from speaking about their, the issues in their complaints process and how they've treated you and the students involved in this complaint? I'm not, I'm not prepared to speculate about that. But um, the, the, the take home message from my case that I want to everybody to uh, understand is both simple and clear. I have done nothing wrong. In spite of this, I have no objection to Brissock lodging a formal complaint against me, even though their motives were highly suspect. However, their refusal to engage in mediation and the launch of their potentially life threatening social media camp campaign is quite another matter. As I've said more than once, they've sought to ruin my reputation, end my career, deprive me of my livelihood, ostracize me from my colleagues, and deliberately or recklessly to expose me to the risk of physical harm. People have been murdered for less. They also stand accused of a raft of legal wrongs, many of which the police are currently investigating. All of this has been on the basis of lies, distortion, and misrepresentation. Their conduct has subjected me and my family to a nightmarish ordeal, and the organizations and individuals I had every right to expect would leap to my defense, either averted their gaze or facilitated one of Bristol's central demands that the module be scrapped. However, others have come, thankfully others have come to my, my aid, and I have not been silenced, although as I've said, I'm sure others will have been. But the bigger and wider, wider problem of which my case is merely sadly a symptom shows no sign of resolution. I refer to the capitulation of universities throughout the English speaking world and indeed beyond to demands by tiny minorities of militant students and others for the sacking of scholars and or the censorship of lawful and legitimate teaching material and perspectives merely because those concerned have a different point of view. This is something which would, should concern all who take freedom, particularly academic, seriously. Thank you so much for your answers to my questions, uh, Professor Greer. That um, it concludes the questions that we were going to go through. Okay. So the first question that we've got, um, even if uh, you agree with the ideas of Professor, uh, Professor Greer, would you agree that there are flaws um, with its implementation uh, particularly in regard to privacy and surveillance? I think the main, the main flaw of its implementation has been a chronic failure to explain it properly. I, I don't think there, there is any case that, it's, that it constitutes um, a sort of surveillance of, uh, that, con that constitutes any kind of invasion of privacy. The, uh, for example, a, a referral to prevent is no more serious than a neighbour phoning to complain about the noise of a late night party or about being offered the opportunity to not to lose three points in your licence when you've broken the, sp broken the speed limit and offering you the, the alternative to go to speed school in uh, uh, instead. It, it does not have, a referral to prevent does not have anything like the catastrophic or uh, devastating consequences that many people claim. Um, it, it also depends, and also the, the whether people whether a prevent referral is taken any further or not depends upon whether the um, subject consents or not. So you, you can, if I was referred to prevent, I would love to be referred to prevent. Actually, I would love to find out what it's all about and how, how it feels to be in that process. But um, I would be fully happy to comply. We go along and. Um, um, I would probably be, one of the many would be filtered out at the very uh, initial stages and there'd be no further consequences. Anybody who's taken any further forward um, has to consent to it and only a tiny minority end up in a formal de-radicalisation programme. Most of those who are actually taken forward uh, beyond the initial referral are offered other forms of support, um, mental health support, um, other, all, all kinds of other, other support. So it's a myth. In other words, the um, the Big Brother kind of alleged implications of prevent are, an, are entirely mythological. 
Thank you. Um, so we've had a couple more questions about um, the cancellations surrounding this event. So this kind of comes in two parts is um, one, what reasons were given for the law from the law school um, for trying to cancel these event, this event? Uh, and the second part that people are asking is why do you think that the law school was so keen for this not to happen? Well, um, hmm. as I've said, uh, my, or I don't know if I said this in this, in this much data, but my fit note, the doctor signed me off from September to 3rd of January this year, right? So in the, in the run up to Christmas last year, I was expecting the university and the law school to set and train a return to work program, which would meant that come the 3rd of January, I would have hit the ground running. I would have been back at work. That didn't happen. Um, in fact, I didn't receive an occupational health consultation until quite a few weeks after that. And um, I had to have another cons of, of, or, 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 or occupational consultation because the original one, my, uh, the, the law school thought the original one wasn't clear enough about whether I was able to work from home or not. I thought it was crystal clear that I was able to work from home or, uh, um, and other places. The big and the big problem is the law school, the physical law school, being physically at the law school. As I said, because my colleagues, some of my colleagues, including people, almost my next door neighbours, some of my next door neighbours, people in the same corridor, have been um, hostile to, to me. So uh, that's the I've been working from home, notwithstanding this, since the beginning of January. I mean, I've been involved with the Oxford Institute for British Islam, for example. Um, I've been getting on with my research because it's boring not to. Um, in fact, it's as my doctors, the two people who conducted each of the other, each of the occupational health consultations um, recognised. Not being allowed to do research is, is worse for your mental health than being able to do it. So that's why I just got on with it at home. And, and, and in any case, how would the law school or the university propose to stop me from doing it? You know, it's just an absurdity. But anyway, the, the law school's position is that even though you've had an occupational health uh, report that clear that the medically clears you from to return to work, you still have to jump through certain bureaucratic hoops before that can happen. And those bureaucratic hoops had not even been set and have not even yet been set in place. So. Um, I'm the performing dog that has perfectly, perfectly um, fit and healthy, but the, but I have to jump through certain circus hoops. But those circus hoops have not even been set up yet. So I mean, people must draw their own conclusions to why that is the case. Um, I can see no good good reason for it. I should have been, as I said, uh, facilitated to return to work at the beginning of January. I'm still not officially supposed to be back at work, but I am. Um, so draw your own conclusions. Yeah, and on that, it's probably worth saying that from our perspectives, um, when when you receive emails to say that, um, you know, you could that to say that uh, or being advised not to attend, we also received emails point blank saying that you weren't allowed to speak without consent or discussion with you yeah. before those emails were sent. Yeah. And yeah. every time these were sent to us the day before the event was meant to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rather, sorry, go on. I, I think that's well. That's very clear. And I think people will draw their own conclusions from that because there's a sharp contrast, I think, between um, the initiation of these emails, the sending of these emails, that every, in every occasion, the day before the um, Free Speech Society is supposed to take place, and then the absence of any activity that facilitates my return to work for the whole of the rest of the time. I mean, that, well, people will draw their own conclusions. Thank you. Um... So there's a question here that says, um, do you think is oh sorry, it's just moved. Uh, do you think Islamophobia can be uh, intertwined with racism? Uh, as many people would perceive certain races as having uh, as being inherently Islamic, for example. Well, that's simply not true. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that most Muslims in this country and most Muslims around the world are in fact non-white. But there are, of course, white Muslims, and therefore um, Islam doesn't map unproblematically on any single race as i said in the presentation or in the answer to your question muslims come from every race under the sun so therefore islamophobia can't be a form of racism 
because Islam is a religion. Islam, like Christianity or um, evangelical religions, they want to, unlike perhaps Judaism, they want to recruit uh, people and they want to expand their the Omar, the community of the faithful. Um, and therefore, they're keen to get uh, uh, anybody uh, anywhere in the world to, to, to persuade them to join the faith. So um, they, it overlaps. Islamophobia and racism overlap. And there's a disconnect and a connection, all kinds of complex connections and disconnections between them. If people want to find out a little bit more about that, they should read my blog. It's a bit too complicated to go into, I think, here. Can't hear you, Ben. You're, you're muted, Ben. Click the wrong button. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, there's another question here that says, um, how should we reconcile the seemingly uh, inevitable clashes between issues such as someone's perspectives on uh, Islamophobia and the need for academic freedom? So I don't really understand the question. Um, so I think this is what it's asking is, how can we as uh, academics or people interested in these discussions um, reconcile um, and mediate between perceptions of Islamophobia and academic freedom? With difficulty, it seems, because there's such a hair trigger. Some people are on such a hair trigger, like, like Brissot, on such a hair trigger that they regard any criticism of Islam, however responsible, measured, valid, evidence-based, as Islamophobic. Um, that's a problem that we face. And... I'm a great believer in the, the, the virtue of open discussion and debate. And that is really the only way forward. We have got to win the argument on the merits. And I think people in the, the, you know, the great British public do not like intolerance and militancy of this kind. Many of them, is, of course, are not really very aware of it. Universities are very remote places for most people. Uh, I suppose some of them may not even care about it. But the problem is that um, attacks upon freedom tend to uh, extend and tend to generate other attacks upon freedom. And um, if you don't nip an any given, given attack upon freedom in the bud, it can uh, contaminate and, and jeopardize other forms of freedom. So we have to do that. But it's got to be done. It's got to be done through reason and argument and, and uh, open debate and discussion. There is no other way forward. And that's why I'm so disappointed that Brissock, instead of bringing these issues to my attention, either through you know formal processes or just by knocking on my door and saying, we're concerned about what you've said, they just launched immediately into a formal complaint. With, with no prospect of mediation and then having not got their way, um, a social media campaign with all the consequences that that has had. Thank you for your answer. Um, so there's been a couple of questions in the um, in uh, Slido about um, a report uh, on prevent by the uh, Rights and Security International. I was wondering if either of the people who asked questions about this would like to um, unmute themselves and maybe outline um, what they read on that report, so Stephen could uh, respond. I'm not sure if you submitted them. We don't get anybody, uh, any takers for that. I'm not sure if you have um, come across this report at all, Stephen. No. Um, oh, hang on, is this Bryce Dixon? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi Ben, I'm, I'm one of the people who asked the question. I haven't read the report myself, I've just seen the headlines about it which suggest that the strategy is is um, is operating in a way that um, provides an, an uncomfortable environment for Muslims and is affecting anti-racist work but I, I've read no word of it so uh, I'm just curious if Stephen has yet seen it thank you well I mean these, these are standard criticisms of prevent that have been in circulation for many many years um, and they don't stack up against the evidence um, read chapter five of my book. Um, I don't think that that those accusations and those complaints um, break any new ground. And as I've said, they they particularly don't stack up against the fact 
the REVENT program is modeled on similar programs pioneered by non-white Muslim countries. Saudi Arabia was, for example, one of the um, leading exponents of this. And although Saudi, Arabia, although Saudi Arabia has a very poor human rights record, their human rights record with the counter-radicalization is exemplary. Um, they don't, you know, torture you or take you into a room and attach electrodes to you. They take you into an air-conditioned room and they have a discussion with you with a, a, a qualified Muslim scholar and they just try and talk you out of your what they believe to be your um, misinterpretation of Islamic faith. That's the way it should happen. And of course, secondly, as I've said, um, prevent isn't um, even 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 predominantly anymore targeted against um, Islamist extremism. Um, over half those referred to it are from what they call mixed, non-stable um, um, back uh, uh, ideologies. And the other, how the so the Islamist Islamist t t concerns are constitute only a quarter of those people referred to prevent, and most of them, will, most of those will be taken no further anyway. Thank you. Um, again, I just there's been a couple more comments in here that have been a bit more uh, um, critical of prevent. So one saying that um, prevent is extremely harmful, and another saying that um, prevent. Uh, hinders freedom of speech and discourages non-violent political activism. I was wondering if either of the people who submitted those comments wanted to uh, maybe expand on those points a little bit more. I think we'd be quite interested to hear what has to be said. Let's give a couple of seconds, and if not, we can move on to another question. Uh, Okay, in lieu of that, then we'll move on to uh, one. We'll move on to uh, another question. Then. Um, so there's we've had a question in the chat that says, um, without make, that kind of goes over what we've said before, but kind of without mentioning names, um, have you kind of heard about how your situation has been received by other um, academics in either your department or others at the university? Yeah, well, I mean, what, what's the question? Sorry. Um, so have you received, so how has your situation been received by other people um, in the department or in other departments around the university? Well, um, with indifference, with, with the, the, the main um, impression that I have is that people either just don't care or are too, or too scared even to venture a, an opinion in a private email. Um, like I said, only a dozen or so of my colleagues, including some of the support staff, have bothered since this whole crisis erupted last February to send me any kind of message of solidarity or support and about the same number of students. And um, the rest of my colleagues, um, many of whom I would have counted amongst my friends, have simply uh, averted their gaze and not said anything or done anything or not not raised any, not engaged with the issue in any shape or form. And I attribute that largely to fear. Fear of many different, several different kinds. Fear of being regarded as an Islamophobe themselves, but also fear that it might prejudice their next promotion or their next salary increment. Because, you know, um, the universe, the, 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 you know, you can be, um, uh, you know, I, I'm 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 regarded as a pariah, or at least when this, this whole this whole uh, controversy kicked off. And in some ways, I think, even though I've been exonerated and everything is um, uh, the fortunes have turned in my favour, my reputation will never be the same again. People will always say, "Oh, that was a guy who was accused of Islamophobia," um, and people don't often hear the sequel to it. People hear of sometimes. They hear the beginning of the story, they don't hear the end of it, and um, you know it's it's been hugely. Let me just say, it's been hugely disappointing that the people and institution, as I said in the in the response to your questions, the people and institutions had every right to expect would leap to my defence, either threw me under the bus or simply turned their backs and averted their gaze as the bus drove over me. Thank you for that. Um, so we've had a couple of 
not questions but comments i think it's probably worth uh mentioning in the uh in the comments so one person saying that um the uk government uh may be directly censoring individuals particularly muslims who challenge the prevent strategy um, or other government counter-terrorism tactics um but there have been quite a few comments um kind of pushing back against your your statements on saudi arabia stating that they um uh fund the Salafi sect and uh, fund terrorism effectively which and one comment says that uh, claiming the contrary only hurts the lives of uh, people in Saudi Arabia do you kind of have a response to these uh, these criticisms well, I did say the Saudi human rights record was to put it mildly not not very commendable but on the on the prevent question on this narrow question of prevent um they've they've pioneered a model that's been copied all around the world because it appears to be um, useful and effective and the most the most humane way of dealing with this this uh, uh, problem but on the on the censorship point i'm the one who's been censored in this debate you know it, this i'm the victim of censorship here not not people who are, are critics of prevent they have they have free reign to to um voice their criticisms as indeed they should have and you know to paraphrase Voltaire I deplore everything that they say but I would fight to the death to defend it to defend their right to do so they do not accord me the same right many of them because they say if you defend prevent you must be a racist and Islamophobe I don't say if you attack prevent you must be a terrorist or a terrorist supporter because that's not true either so please accord me the same right to freedom of expression as i would accord you as i do accord you thank you um so i'm going to take two more questions uh that we've got here uh the first come from a couple of people which is um kind of focusing on this potentially legal action taken uh, against uh some of the members of brisk so someone has referred to that it seems like some of what's been posted is uh is libelous or slander um and you know so do you think that do you, do you think that that's true that they have uh slandered you um yeah, and secondly pardon? yeah they have there's no question that what they've said is defamatory to accuse somebody of being an islamophobe and demand their that they be sacked from a, a post that they've held for over 35 years is patently defamatory now what you do about defamation is is another matter because it's expensive and difficult to take legal action. Basically, only rich people can afford to take uh, actions for defamation or, or slander or, or libel. Um, and I, we haven't reached a decision yet about whether this is going to, going to happen or not. The legal action that's being considered is being taken against the University of Bristol for its breach of the duty of care that owes me in not having defended me effectively from Brissock's social media campaign um that that's the main thrust of the litigation but um you know the other the other issue has still not been not been resolved there's still plenty of time for it to be uh, initiated if we decided to go down that route thank you and the last question that i'd like to ask is um so what do you think the consequences will be um for academic freedom and debate of the silence of the university management of the law school um and ucu after your exoneration i think it's huge I think there is a crisis of um, in academic freedom in in the UK and elsewhere. It's even worse actually in the United States. And of course, as with many things, many trends or or or, or uh, processes, um, Britain catches the the disease after the United States has suffered from it. And it's 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 a problem in France as well. For example, I don't think it's a problem in Germany or other some other European countries, but certainly we are greatly afflicted by it. Uh, and as I said earlier in my response to one of your other questions the, the essence of the problem is that you, tiny militant uh, groups of militant minorities uh, uh, militant uh, groups of, of students and uh, staff because by threatening and accusing people of being outside the frame of what's um, politically acceptable racist islamophobic whatever it might be transphobic they can the, the universities therefore have a knee-jerk response to capitulate to their demands without investigating well in my case they did investigate it but it took them some time um 
uh, the, the complaints and without defending the people uh, uh, criticised effectively from them. I think it's a big, it's a very, very big problem. Um, but I will say, I want, I want, if this is the end of the our discussion, I will finish on, on, on a positive note. The future, the best future, depends upon people like you, Ben, and your colleagues, people in the free speech society. You have, I'm at the end of my career. I'm done now. I've got a few more things to say, um, but uh, I'm not much time left in which to say them. Um, you, you guys are the ones who've got to carry the torch for freedom forward. And I'm hugely encouraged by the fact that there is a Bristol Free Speech Society, that, that there are free speech champions in other places, that there's a kickback and a reaction from students themselves against this kind of intolerance and militancy on the part of other students. That is the best way forward. And more power to you for having the courage to host this event and others like it and to open people's eyes to the, the, the predicament that we're in. Thank you so much for your, your confidence there. We really appreciate it. And I think fundamentally, thank you so much for uh, coming along, giving your time to us and uh, answering all of our questions as well.